Uh, I'm a second year PhD student in physics. I'm a vice president of the Stanford India Association, whose banner you can see here. And I'll, it's my privilege to introduce our guest today. Uh, the event, as you know, is about the new parties in India, Aam Aadmi Party and Lok Satta Party in particular, and we'll talk about how they can bring about fighting corruption, their role in the upcoming elections, and their role in Indian democracy at large. So, first we have Mr. Abhay Bhushan, who's second here. He is an internet pioneer, and he wrote FTP, which stands for File Transfer Protocol, way back in the 70s at MIT. And he's a Bay Area entrepreneur, uh, an environmental and community activist. He went to IIT Kanpur, did uh, his master's and PhD from MIT, and he also has an MBA from MIT. He was a president of Pan IIT USA and so on. So he's been in the Bay Area for a long time, and he's an activist. And yeah, so let's put. Uh, Mr. Pran Kuru, who's also a Bay Area entrepreneur, and he's been a political commentator and writing about the Amadmi Party for a long time. He's the founder and CEO of Vitalec, which is an e-learning company, and he's also the former president of Silicon Valley Indian Professionals Association and alumnus of IIT Kharagpur. Uh, Mr. Kalyan Raman is a former people for Lok Sata, former president for People for Lok Sata, and he's. Uh, is promoting like Lok Sattar Party's activities in the Bay Area. He's organized several political forums and he's an alumnus of the Wharton School of Management and holds an engineering degree as well. And, uh, among the young person here is Mr. Roshan Shankar, who's a double master student at Stanford uh, in management science and engineering and public policy. He's from Delhi and he's very interested in the city and in the politics of the city. And he'll be the moderator of the panel discussion for today. Right. So without any further ado, I'll give it up to Roshan to introduce the topic of the panel discussion and uh, start the conversation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's very, I'm honored to be a part of this panel and um, yeah, be a moderator for today's event. So today we're gonna talk about um, uh, the rise of new political parties in India and where they stand. So, as you know, there's been uh, a, a lot of democratic systems in the world have uh, tried successfully and unsuccessfully to bring about change in uh, the political regimes and, and thus uh, how they do reforms in their country. For example, um, I think it was Ross Perot in the US uh, who's tried to start a new political uh, party with, which is self-financed because he was a rich industrialist and uh, won 20 percent of the total vote in that presidential elections, uh, but still didn't win uh, any uh, electoral college votes. The system is slightly different in India, obviously, where uh, there are different constituencies. You can still have a few people winning a few seats and then maybe build, up, build it up. Uh, so I think um, what we're going to do today is for the first half an hour, we're going to have each of our speakers uh, talk about the questions that we sent out in the email uh, event. So we talk about can they succeed against these two big behemoths? So the Congress and the BJP all, all have a huge political history, as well as money, which is seemingly and is an important part of how politics is done in India, whether there is a chance for a party which is not 100 years old or 50 years old to actually succeed in the system. Uh, is this what we, is, is clean politics and transparency um, is what is needed for to win in India. So can you actually get the votes on the ground? So at a broad level, if you looked at your Facebook or your Twitter or anywhere these days, you'd find the Amalmi Party or Lok Sata or, F or clean government in general trending. Mm -hmm. But you'd always see that that never translates into votes, at least till now. Mm -hmm. So whether that is actually going to happen, and some more realistic ground level uh, questions: whether how many seats do they expect to win? What I mean. Uh, assuming they don't win the majority, what sort of role is the Amadi party thinking of playing in Delhi? Um, so I think, and what the best role for individuals who are for clean government is to do. So do you stay like Anna Hazari, do you stay apolitical and you work from outside the system to change the broader level of thinking or do you actually, is it important to be a part of the system itself and, uh, and, and try to change it uh, actively, uh, like Anil Kapoor and Nayak? So I think that's yeah. that's it, what I have for now. And I'll turn over uh, it to Mr. Abhay Bhushan first, and then in the order of speakers to uh, share their thoughts on these broad questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bhushan. 
And thank you, Raghu, for the introduction. I just for, uh, want to tell that I have three advanced degrees from MIT. PhD is not one of them. Oh. But I started working on the internet, and they did not think internet was worthy of a PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, let me ask you a question. How many of you over here came to the Anna Hazare event? It's a show of hands. Very good. How many of you have seen the Satyagraha movie? OK. And I'll let me just give you a little two-minute background. I've gotten involved with uh, India, of course, since I've brought up there with IIT Kanpur, came to MIT. I went back to India in 78. In 78, to work in the village. I saw firsthand how the government was functioning even at that time. The corruption was very nascent at that time, but there was a bureaucracy, the license raj. The license raj got abolished. Some of the corruption at the level of cement control, all these things vanished. But the other corruption, the political corruption started really skyrocketing. It started with Bofors, that were the Senate combination, and the political parties and the, some of the, like the Rajiv Gandhi family got a huge amount of money and that just came out of the Swedish government to use that to perpetuate themselves. So that is kind of the beginning of the large scale political business nexus corruption that really, there were a few scams before. Uh, Chagla scam, you know, in the 50s and other things, but there were few in poverty. Now, you see a scam happening. I mean, there's so many that you can't even keep track of them. Uh, I met uh, Arvind Kejriwal, who started the Amalmi Party in 2006, when Indians for Collective Action, an organization that I joined after coming back from India in 79, uh, we honored him for his work to write to information, which has made a big difference. In fact, uh, many people have called, or some people, not many, have called uh, Arvind Kejriwal, she do so thus. Why? Because he cut charts for BC in half. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we honored him, and I met him, and I really liked the way he thought about it all, his dedication. And then uh, we honored Kiran Bedi for her work in the prison reform before the anti-corruption movement. She had been doing it. She was a police officer. We honored her in 2010 for the exemplary work she did. These are the kind of people who, from the with their heart, want to change India. Uh, and Prashant, I've known since his birth. He's my first cousin. And he stayed the whole year that when I was in India, 78, 79. He was just 22. And we had a great time. And when he was in Princeton, he spent all his vacations with me. So he and I were equals. And uh, Anna Hazare, we honored. Uh, he could not come in 2011 along with Prashant Bhushan <clears throat> because we were trying to honor people who are really making a difference in the lives of people. So I've kind of stayed in touch with them and seeing what's happening. I go to India frequently. <coughs> so let me start with something about the vehemence. Can these new parties, Lok Sattva started in 2003. We honored Jay Prakash Narayan, the founder of Lok Sattva in 2003. He came here. Wonderful person, really dedicated IAS officer who quit IAS because he saw what was going on. He just like Arvind quit the Indian Revenue Service as a tax commissioner. He saw what was happening. He could not make the change from inside the bureaucracy. You have to leave it. I mean, you always get thrown out that they put false charges on you and all of these things happen. So how would these people succeed? They have no money. Uh, they have no power base. Like BJP is in the, even in Delhi elections that are coming on December 4th. BJP is, half of Delhi is controlled by BJP as the MCD. So they can't say, hey, you know, you're doing it, we're not doing it. They're all part of the system. Delhi state is controlled by the Congress party. So I don't know how many of you have seen this book, David and Goliath, a Malcolm Gladwell. Have you heard about it? Yes. yes. It's kind of an interesting book because it really, in some sense, if I was to write the last chapter of the book, I'd write the Ahmadi party. <laughs> because it is a classic David and Goliath battle. Uh, what do you do? You don't have money, you don't have power, but you have citizen empowerment. You can change the game. You slingshot instead of heavy armor and spears and all those things. That's how David won. So what Aam Aadmi Party is doing, what is the weakness of these behemoths, the Congress and the BJP and the, U, the alliances and things? Uh, it is corruption and their <coughs> addiction to it and they're afraid of exposing any corruption. They're not going to pass the Jandok pathway. Anna Hazare, Arun Kejival, the India against corruption, discovered they're not going to make any change because who are they going to expose themselves? They're not going to do it. And they're addicted to it. 
even if they could and say, hey, you know, there's complete immunity for any past corruption, everything, they wouldn't do it. They're addicted to it. It's like money. It's like an addiction to them. They're addicted to this power. Second thing is centralization of decision-making power. Everything is done by the high command. Okay, who decides who's going to be a prime minister? There's a high command there. Who's going to be the next candidate? There's no intra-party democracy. So what happens? You have this high command culture. So this, that's a weakness for them. Aging and stale leadership, no new ideas. You see, don't see young people there. Okay, 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 of course, if they're Prince Rahul, they will be there. But uh, you know, son of somebody, otherwise there's no room for anybody. People are feeling powerless. So what they're fighting with is optimum decentralization of power, clean and transparent processes, uh, citizen empowerment and involvement, financial power to states, and they kind of take participative decision making. So these are the ways they're getting a lot of young people involved. So that's the David aspect that they're doing. They're doing is, hey, we can use things and turn uh, the, against them uh, the behemoth strengths of what they think is their strength. The corruption is turned against them. So these things are the way I think they're going to win. And I'll just kind of touch one of more kind of things and then you can later on touch the challenges and things in our discussion, what they're facing. And I just thought it was very happy to see that Jay Prakash and I just last month uh, came out and said that he's going to support uh, Aam Aadmi Party in Delhi. So the like-minded people are coming together. Meera Sanya, I don't know if you read that. Yes. She's yes. one of the people mm -hmm. who yeah. contested from Bombay. She has joined and now campaigning in Delhi. So people who want the real change, who want to give people of India power, the citizen power, are joining in. So I am very hopeful and we'll discuss more. So I'll pass it on to Pran. Thank you, Abhay. Um, good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. What I thought I'd do today is to first, you know, take a look at India's political history, starting with 1947, and try to answer this fundamental question as to how did we end up where we are today? I mean, we know that we are in a complete mess today, but how did we exactly end up in this mess today? So if you look back at 1947, when India first won its independence, it was the culmination of several years of hard work put in by a number of people mobilized by people like Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Patel, Ambedkar and others. Now, when India won its independence, there was probably a lot of um, nationalistic fervor and, you know, feeling among the people that, you know, I need to contribute to make my country better. Here is a newly, you know, independent country. I have worked hard to be part of this movement. I need to do something to help the country. So that mindset persisted for a few years, and that momentum kept us going for about 20 years. So until about the late 60s, if you look at some of our leaders from those times, you have people like Jawaharlal Nehru and um, Dr. Radha Krishnan, um, Sardar Patel, um, you, you know, so many other leaders that you could think of, each of who you know, automatically gain the respect of pretty much everyone, even to this very day. But in the late 60s, after Lal Bahadur Shastri died, um, a significant transformation happened in Indian politics in the sense that Mrs. Gandhi stepped into the picture and she dominated Indian politics for the next 15 to 20 years, until the time of her death. And there are a few things that she did which had a lasting impact on Indian politics. First and foremost, she believed in centralizing power. She became the sole decision maker for pretty much everything in the country. And this means that she completely destroyed any kind of second level of leadership, no kind of intra-party democracy, and slowly she brought in her son, Sanjay Gandhi, as well, and transformed the Congress party into a family-owned business. And unfortunately for India, that became the model that started to be followed in other parts of the country. So if you go to Tamil Nadu, Karnanidhi transformed the DMK into a family-owned party. In Orissa, there's the you know, Patnaik family. If you go to Karnataka, there's the Devagoda family. You go to Maharashtra, there is, you know, the, the Shiv Sena family. So you, could, you can keep going from state to state and you'll find that this is exactly the scenario. Now, the bigger impact of this having, this having happened is that people started to shun politics. Unlike the first 10, 15 years when people never bat an eyelid to serve the country, people started to say, hey, you know, I don't want to be in politics. When, you know, when you, I still remember growing up as a kid, people used to say, okay, he's good for nothing, he will end up in politics. 
That is what people used to say. When I used to get bad marks in my exams, my dad used to look at it and say, With these kind of scores, you don't have any hope. You have to try and get into a political party. No college is going to accept. I mean, it's a fact. People, it had such a derogatory impact that people, it's like saying, you know, tell kids that you don't drink your milk, Gabbar Singh will come. It's like that, right? <laughs> you don't work hard and do well in school, you'll end up in politics. You're like completely worthless. That was the kind of mindset people had. And believe it or not, that has persisted in the Indian psyche for so many years until even today. Yeah. The other day I heard Yogendra Yadav mention in TV channel, he was saying, you know, it's impossible to get people to join politics, although there are so many qualified people around yeah, right. who are very good, creditable people who don't want to be in politics, simply because it's got a bad rap for the last so many decades. Now, this was a big, big problem that has lasted over the years in India. And um, when new parties came along, they didn't have the kind of appeal that today, let's say, the Lok Sita Party or the Ahmadmi Party has among the educated middle class. So you had the BJP come in, which is essentially a religious party. You had the Bahujan Samaj Party, which came up, which is essentially a caste-based party. So you didn't have parties which had that kind of mass appeal across religions, across caste, all those you know, problems that we have in India. We didn't have that kind of appeal among the people. So as a result of that, you know, our politics has start, sort of started to linger in the same model where people stayed away from politics and the Congress party by default started to win and continued to be in power for so many years. Another turning point in Indian politics was when liberalization set in in the 1990s. Now, by itself, liberalization is not a bad thing. It was the right thing to have done. But what it did was that the industrial houses became so strong and so powerful that they could manipulate government. So if you think of the Neera Radia tapes, it is a clear indication that with the help of middlemen and leading lights in the media, the industrial houses could fix who gets what portfolio. So you can imagine, so that has been going on for the last two decades. So we find ourselves today in 2013 in a cesspool of corruption, black money, nepotism, you know, people with criminal records in parliament and in assemblies. So that is basically the situation we are in today. So the question is, how can we transform the situation today? And one way this can be transformed is if our political parties start to reform. And my personal view is that our political parties are just too established to reform themselves. They're too enmeshed in the cesspool of corruption that we are in today. And I'll give you specific examples. Take the case of the Congress, for instance. Rahul Gandhi goes around the country saying, we need to have intra-party democracy, we need to encourage grassroots level leaders. And then what does he do? He turns around and accepts the vice presidency of the uh, Congress party. He's nominated as the vice president. He could very well have said, intra-party democracy begins with me. We will have an open, free, and fair election within the Congress party. And whoever wants to stand, let's stand and have an open debate and have voting. But he wouldn't do that. He simply cannot do that simply because that whole idea goes against the ethos of the Congress party, which is based on reverence and deference of the Congress to the Gandhi family. It cannot see a world where, you know, the Gandhi family is not running the Congress party. And then you take the case of um, the recent ordinance saga. You know, you came out after the PM and the cabinet met and decided on an ordinance and sold it to the, at an odd party meeting, and it was proposed as an ordinance, and next thing you know, he walks in and he says, no, this is not, uh, this is nonsense. And then it goes completely out of the picture. Now this is because that's how the Congress party is run. Unfortunately, that's not how a democracy should be functioning. So if you look at the Congress party, can you imagine a Congress party having a free and fair investigation into Robert Walter's dealings? No. Definitely not. Can you ever see the Congress party telling us where the 2,000 crores in donation came from? Again, definitely not. So I'm not picking on the Congress party. The BJP is no different. Now, if you think about the BJP, uh, by the way, before I get started, is there anybody who's a Modi fan here? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Good. I oppose the, the statement you made on BJP being a religious party. What, 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 on what ground do you make the statement? Okay, we can we can Let's get into the details at a later point in our discussion. Statement. Sorry? You cannot make such statements. Uh, that's that's what we'll have. Okay, that's a, it's an opinion. You're open, to your, you're open to your views and I am open to my views. So let's we can have an honest discussion at the end of this. So when it comes to Mr. Modi, who is otherwise very outspoken, and again, before I want to, before I get into this, I want to clearly say my intent is not to cast as persons on his track record or the fact that he's the no, god of governance. Party available today. Sorry? It is the only secular party available today. 
You okay. cannot find discussions on, on BJP as, as a religious party. I'm sure, sure. That's your view. Party. You have an opportunity to express your views. Please. Did Arvind Kejriwal contest an election with an Ahmad party to become chief minister kind of be Delhi? No, no, no. no please. Was please. there election? Oh, there will be question answer. There will be a question answer Was session. We can just. Arvind Kejriwal become chief minister kind of be Delhi? How many votes did he get from the Ahmad party? You are not exactly making a great case for the BJP. Interrupting yeah. again. Uh, you will get a, everyone will have a, there will be a Q&A session Good in the end. Time. And we appreciate. Uh, we appreciate listen. the passion, but yeah. we appreciate silence as well. Thank you. Thank you. So when it comes to Mr. Modi in this particular case, as far as the ordinance is concerned, the um, an otherwise outspoken Mr. Modi had very little to say about the ordinance, and that is because the BJP themselves would have been beneficiaries should the ordinance have passed. Today you have 32 MLAs in the Gujarat Assembly who have criminal records against them. We have Babu Bhai Bukaria who has been convicted of an, um, in a mining scam case who is still in, the, uh, in Mr. Modi's cabinet. So, uh, same thing with regard to the funding. 800 crores that BJP has raised in, in terms of donation. Are they going to tell us where it came from? So, despite his, uh, Mr. Modi's best intentions, it's very difficult for him to break away from the framework that he is part of. He has, he has grown from the bottom of the ladder and come to the top in a party which is fundamentally no different from the Congress. It has got similar problems, it's got similar issues that the Congress party has. And the same is true of all the regional parties. If you take the Samajwadi party, you take the, um, uh, the BSP, you take the AIDMK, all three of them, the top leaders, all have disproportionate asset cases against them. So where do you begin? So each of these parties have reached a point where they are so enmeshed in the system that they cannot reform themselves. So India's hope and future lies in new political parties like the Lok Sattha Party and the Ahmadmi Party stepping forward and gaining popularity and winning elections. Now, the advantage of being a new political party are many, just as there are disadvantages. Now, from an advantage point of view, they have no baggage. So they can afford to make mistakes, and if they make mistakes, they can be you know, comfortable enough to say, hey, we made a mistake, like the candidate recently was replaced in, in Delhi. So there's no issue with that. Now, likewise, with regard to funding, they can open up the funding and say, here is where our money came from. Here is our income and expense statement. Things that no party has done before, and none of the existing parties are ever going to be capable of doing. So there's a distinct advantage, but the disadvantage is name recognition. People do not know that the party exists, they do not know the symbol. So those are things that have to be countered by elections, uh, by campaigning, sorry. And then um, in terms of other you know, issues like right to reject, right to recall, political decentralization, these are issues that they can bring up and stand for and commit to, which other parties cannot very easily do. Now, so I think change in India is inevitable. The question is how soon and how fast it's going to happen. And I think the litmus test for that is the Amadmi Party's battle in Delhi. Should the Amadmi Party wins, win handsomely in Delhi, things are going to change dramatically. And first and foremost, I think politics is going to become cool again. People are going to join politics in droves. People are going to say that I too can make a difference. I don't need to go and become an engineer or a doctor. It's, I've been, I mean, there's so many people who put their careers on hold, their, their education on hold to work for the Aam Aadmi Party. Those people are going to stand up and say, hey, this is not a bad thing. I can see myself doing this for the rest of my life. So you'll have people who, you know, take to politics in a big way. You're going to see new role models. You know, people are going to say that I'm going to, I want to be the next Arvind Kejriwal. Moms and dads are going to say, I want my kid to be the next Arvind Kejriwal. So that kind of thinking will evolve. There will be a sort of nationalistic fervor that will be, you know, become more popular among the people. You're going to see people step up and want to serve the country. And lastly, if you, uh, I'm sure every one of us has friends who say, you know, India is a hopeless case. It's not going to change. You can do whatever you want. In your lifetime, it's not going to change. It's beyond redemption. Things are really bad. It's never going to improve. Should the Aam Aadmi Party win in Delhi and win handsomely in Delhi, even those people will come around. Then you're going to have, you know, belief that things can change, take hold. And when that kind of belief start to take hold, then the change will automatically come. And it will come fast and furious. And I'm hopeful that this will happen. Let's see where it goes. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Stanford Students Association. Thank you to Asha for Education for hosting us. Roshan, Raghu, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, already Abhayaji and uh, Pran have talked about a lot of those issues that 
uh, frankly, are very similar to how we got started and what we've been doing. Uh, but the benefit for us is we've been around for a little longer. Uh, and so we've had the luxury of thinking about this from long term as well as short term perspective. And um, we're, uh, you know, you can ask uh, Jay Prakash is on uh, YouTube, on radio, on all kinds of things. The question is not if, but when will that change come? Uh, because, um, you know, with a lot of, uh, India does have a lot of problems. Okay? So there's lack of transparency, there's criminalization of politics, there is uh, judicial delays. Uh, pathetic policy framing, even worse policy execution, uh, and so on and so forth. And so the, the problems are not one or two, and that's why our response always has been, the answer to bad politics is not no politics, it is good politics and more politics. And for more people to join politics on, a, on an active basis, like uh, Pran just talked about. And um, in looking at all of these uh, multifarious issues, basically what we've come to conclusion at, at the root, and this is not my conclusion, I'm obviously repeating uh, what I've heard from JP, um, is the root of all of this is uh, centralization. That came thanks to the British and thanks to, we were having a discussion just before, that this was not an Indian origin thing, this whole centralization concept. Uh, India was never managed centrally by one empire. So it was uh, something that's only like 90, 150 years old in India. Uh, and the second piece is, frankly, the abdication of responsibility by the middle classes, by the educated classes. And as Pran talked about, it's uh, it's you know when the when the independence happened, a um, lot of educated families, a lot of middle class families started saying you know they looked at a educated future for their children because they were deprived of that for years and years. And this gave us an opportunity to get back into the economic um, uh, dream. And essentially, that's what's happened. So now, um, irrespective, of, in fact, our view is even broader. Irrespective of what party comes to power, uh, you can't hold back this movement anymore. Right. So this is almost a, uh, and, and especially if, if something like uh, this Aram Aadmi party win happens in Delhi, that becomes a, a catalyst for this, and that makes it even faster uh, in, in process. Um, we also believe uh, that most of these problems that India faces are solvable. Okay? We are one of the world's largest uh, economy. In fact, I'm a history buff, so for those of you that want to follow, India was the first or second largest economy for 18 of the 20 centuries of mankind, from, from 180. Uh, there's economic history and it was the largest economy for 18 years despite foreign rule uh, in the country. And so these problems are, and it's coming back, right? So it's, it's a trillion dollar economy, it's got money, it's got people, it's got manpower, it's got the world's biggest market, uh, middle class market. So <coughs> what is imp impeding it is politics. And I think that the educated people are going to uh, get up and basically overthrow the shackles. And, and that's because there's multifarious problems to solve. There's problems on education, there's health, there's crime, there's um, environment, um, civil action, um, even all, all the way down to traffic on the streets. Uh, all solvable and all within grasp of you know, one or two uh, good policy and policy execution papers. And so we have to learn to live with more transparency. People are demanding it. It's not a choice, respect of what party comes to power. Uh, it's not by choice that the Congress passed RTI, for example. Uh, it's not a choice that they're pass, passing a um, Right to Services Act. Mm -hmm. And so all of this has to happen because there's an overwhelming demand. That's what the Prime Minister said when he placed the Lokpal as well in the Parliament. That, uh, you know, we, you just can't hold back uh, the floodgates anymore. Um, so, so we, as uh, Avai said, uh, at the very beginning, we, um, not only recently, but actually as soon as COP was uh, announced, uh, we were one of the first parties to encourage and, and say that, you know, we, we, uh, we love this development. In fact, even when Anaji was in his protest, we were requesting him to think of this. Uh, and that is because uh, we, we said, you know, it's a long, hard, and lonely journey. Uh, we still believe it's hard, but it's not lonely anymore. And we have a uh, great uh, company uh, from Amadmi Party. Um, and, and also, I think, uh, when we talk about these people, I mean, these, these, uh, Avedi talked about uh, Arvind, but also, um, you know, when Prashant was here, I tried to create his bio to introduce him in some uh, forums. That's when I realized this is one lawyer who's sitting in the Supreme Court who's fought his, I'm, I'm going to read out four of his cases. Uh, this is all public interest litigation cases, no money taken. Uh, people of India versus Government of India on Beauforts. Um, people of India versus Union Carbide at Bhopal. Uh, people of India versus Government on 2G spectrum allegation. 
uh, cold block allocation in uh, Bangalore. <laughs> one lawyer sitting down and doing this without a, a darn thing. So these are people who have uh, set the example over not one year, not two years. There were a lot of questions on radio yesterday, Pranak, to you. So I've been around for 60 years. They didn't just fall from the trees. And for 60 years, they've shown how they lived. So uh, we believe that uh, this, is a direction, this is a positive direction, but there are a lot of problems to solve. So hopefully the Delhi uh, population will welcome uh, Amadmi party. And uh, if they do, that also has obviously very, um, very powerful impact for us as well, because one of the biggest things that Lok Sita has been faced with is, hey, you guys are good, you're very smart, but I don't think you'll actually win. Mm -hmm. And if somebody wins, uh, there's no such, uh, there's no more explanation to be given. Thank you so much for your comments. I'll take the first uh, round of questions uh, in, in the same order in which you spoke. So uh, I think my, I guess we'll do reverse order, sorry. Oh. So, um, uh, my first question about the Lok Sarta party itself is, since you've had a longer time span in trying to set up a new political party, um, what have you, have what been your experiences and what do you think that the Amadmi party can learn um, uh, from your experience um, in setting up this new political party that's trying to compete against these people? And the second question that I have for you as well is, you, so you spoke about like these icons who are doing this great amount of work, they're doing public interest litigation, not taking any money. Um, so that's like icons in any other field. So, I, so I, I feel like icons influence that particular field in a very, very crucial way. So for example, Pakistan has a lot of fast bowlers because they had Wasim Akram and Ran Khan and that to look up to. And I think a lot of Indians always prefer to bat because we only saw Gavaskar and such and things like that. But the problem with icons in general, I find, is that it never, re it never really follows up with a system. So you've, I find today that I've, it's amazing that Prashant Bhushan can do all these things and Arvind Kejriwal is amazing in whatever he does. But what is the next round of uh, people who are after them? How do we uh, institutionalize the really good work that they're doing? So I think that's my question to um, Kalyan. Uh, question to Pran would be about, so you spoke about the economic freedom and political freedom we have. So an Indian citizen can actually go out there, vote, and we are a politically free country. But um, in one of Arun Shuri's books, he talks about an invisible government that India has. So, the, so that because they've become so systematically entrenched with politics in India, the Congress and BJP are essentially the same party. So in the US, if you actually voted, you're, you're voting towards being fiscally conservative or fiscally liberal, socially conservative or socially liberal. So there's actually, when a voter goes into an election booth, he's making a decision to vote one side or the other. But in India, we, we never speak about what sort of political, uh, economic ideology that we have when we go into the world. And that has a spiraling effect on corporates as well. So if you look at the, even though they don't have numbers, you have broad level contributions from each of these corporate houses. They both, they both donate both the sides in some sense. So my first, my question to you would be, how do you get uh, the corporates to change their mind? about Because they're basically hedging their bets when they donate to both sides. And is, is two is, how do you make a politically free public also economically free? So what, do, what changes do you propose, say, in the Constitution or the way in which legislation takes place so that people are actually free, which I don't think, and Arun Shori think is also not true. And my last set of questions to uh, uh, Abhaji is, so you see um, a lot of promises being made by the Amadbi party. So in his most recent video, he talks about, oh, we will have a commando force for women. We have, uh, he, he's tied up with the auto union as well to have those banners behind them. There's uh, things that relate to free water and free electricity and like, that they should be given. While that's great from uh, possibly an election winning perspective because you win over voters in a certain way, do you actually see that translating into actual policy action? Can you actually make a female commando force? Can you actually make a, um, a, a give out these freebies? And the second point is, as well as the other side is doing this as well. So you said that the MCD is in Delhi. So you're basically fighting against two competitors. So there, uh, as I'm sure you've heard in November, if you were on the radio, you've heard that uh, there was free LPG being given across many constituencies in Delhi. Uh, electricity rates have been cut by half immediately. And if you go and talk to someone, uh, they all say, yeah, we're just going to vote for whoever gave us this most recent preview. So when the mindset itself is 
uh, on a recency bias. Oh, this person gave me something, so I'm going to repay them with a vote. How do you change that voting scenario? Okay. Start with the reverse order. Thanks. Um, so even though this was not addressed to me, uh, please take um, uh, half a minute on this. <laughs> This is a very passionate point, point of ours, and, and that is about um, you know the entire election, the Indian election tamasha, as they call it, happens without a single discussion about policy, as if education policy doesn't matter, as if healthcare doesn't. Matter. Who here can talk about what is the education policy of the Congress Party? Primary education, healthcare, um, civil liberties, crime, environment. No one. Uh, there's some document written somewhere that even uh, you know the leaders of the party cannot actually articulate. And so that um, that happens on both sides, and actually on pretty much on every side. So, so we believe that there, there has to be debate, and democracy doesn't end when somebody votes, but when they actually participate in nation building. Uh, and therefore, um, there should be the best minds coming together on all of these issues. Um, you asked us about uh, what have we learned uh, from being around, and I have several of my friends here as well. So, if you have anything to add, please uh, raise your hands, talk about it. Um, so it's been a, a few years and I think what, one thing we've learned is it's very hard to change uh, public mindset uh, from very established notions. So I think people have a general, there's a lot of difference we believe between somebody liking you and voting for you. Uh, because, uh, and we've come to the conclusion that it's because of electoral reforms that need to happen and so on, but uh, that be what it may, uh, we believe that you know while so we go out and actually when we started raising money in the last elections, it wasn't the rich guys or the middle class people that were giving us money. It was the rickshaw puller who was giving us the 100 rupees he had earned for that afternoon. Um, and so this notion of, you know, Am Janta will not learn or not follow this was completely wrong. So we, so we learned that, but we actually never got the votes though. So, <laughs> so we didn't know if that 5,000, if somebody gave them 5,000 and he gave us 100 from that. But, <laughs> but, but uh, so that conversion into votes is a very hard thing, and I think uh, um, what Arvind has done of going out and saying we will win, we are not here to just trouble people, but actually to win, uh, and to demonstrate that with the wave is, is uh, something from. Um, we obviously learned a lot else about polygamy and system building, building other people into the thing, and uh, and I think Pran, you said uh, it's very hard to bring in educated uh, people into this mix. Very few people want to take it on. It's something that somebody wants to take on after their retirement, uh, if they are, uh, if they, if they're feeling very strongly about it. And there's nothing wrong with those people coming in, but you need the people who walk the roads as well and who will talk about this in a very passionate way. And that's what Ahmad Bihati has already kind of uh, triggered. So, um, what we have to see is how long will they keep it sustained? Because Arvind has already said this is not a one-time flash in the pan thing. This is going to be a party for a while. Um, you also, so that's, that was my response to the next rung and so we've, we've uh, actually we're very proud to say that we have one of the first parties, probably the only party that has conducted its own internal election. Uh, so even JP has not got elected, uh, not got appointed and he had to fight his own election and so did the guy who runs the Andhra Pradesh seat and uh, each of the board sings and so on. So there's a internal election, we had the campaign based on what we do if we win. Uh, and this is one of the first parties, and we've been trying to encourage the CEC to drive that kind of uh, representation for our system. Thank you. Thank you. Now, there are two parts to your question. The first one about the corporates coming around. I think um, transparency will address a lot of those issues. I mean, today you look at the Congress, they officially announced numbers, 2,000 crores, and that is what they've gotten in terms of donations. And you know, BJP has got 800 crores, and that's officially announced numbers, right? So clearly the corporates are not giving equal amounts. There's different amounts going different places. So there has to be complete transparency in terms of who's giving what, and that has to be introduced and maintained by, you know, the election commissioner, whoever should be very strict in terms of making sure that that transparency is there. And if that transparency is enforced, then you're going to see um, corporates also being forced to behave accordingly as opposed to giving money under, under the table or unaccounted funds and things like that. So that is one part of it. The other part of it is about, you know, today the most political parties today have a concept of a high command. So the high command sort of decides 
which, which way they're going to vote, both at, both at the assembly level as well as at the parliament level. So an individual MA, MLA or an MP has absolutely no say. He's just going by what the party decides. So there has to be a change in the system where you know, each MLA's voice counts. Everybody needs to know how they voted. There has to be open debate. All those kind of things have to happen. And I think a lot of that will start to happen if some of the things that uh, the Amandi party is talking about in terms of decentralization of power was introduced, where decisions are made at the lowest level of the rung, where, you know, there is clear visibility in terms of each, you know, elected representative. What has he contributed? How has his area improved? What has he done? at the national level or at the state level for the particular constituency that, that elected him. Now, when that accountability is built into the system, then you're going to see more and more a, a much better improved system whereby everyone who's elected doesn't say, okay, I'm elected now for the next five years, I don't need to bother, I'll come back after five years for another vote. That's not going to happen. They're going to be accountable on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that those two are basically things that I feel will help address the issue. Okay, Roshan, you asked two questions. First was, how is Aam Admi Party going to deliver on its promises? So, and that's also related to the other question, what are those promises? So let me just uh, start on the first one and then I'm going to say I was going to deliver. I mean, there's some issues, topical issues for the local people, like you've mentioned electricity and water supply, free or lower charge by 30% of what it is where the funds are going is one part of it. Availability of water supply and availability of electric power in the related question. Uh, the uh, other part that is there is promising is education. Uh, as you all know, India has 500 million young people under the age of 21. Over half of India's population is under 25. And a lot of them are, hundreds of millions of people are in elementary school, middle school, high school age. They're not getting education. I know from personal experience working there. The government schools are not functioning. Uh, the people don't have access. Education is key to India's future. Education and training, training of technical training of people, so that people are able to produce the goods and services that are con a growing country demands. And so that's where the funds are going to come from. How they're going to be accountable. So the two things they're going to deliver promises. One is local involvement. Those of you who have brought up your children, as I have, in the United States, you know their school board, they're locally controlled. The state and central control is very, very little. And they function because they're accountable. Your local community, the schools are accountable to you. So the accountability of schools and the funds is one. Second, when you take corruption out, it's siphoning away by any imagination, the total corruption at different levels cycles away 20, 30% or more funds that could be there. And then effective utilization through uh, accountability. And that's why they're having 70 different manifestos in the 70 different constituencies asking the people, what are your needs? How can we do that? This was actually started a long time before. Uh, Arvind started Mohalla Samitis in Delhi, which were making the government accountable to the RTI. You got this much money, you got from the RTI, where is it being spent? What are our priorities? Is it this or this? So when local people are setting their priorities, things work better. Same with the village rural level, because we're not touched rural India, Delhi is mostly urban, some villages there. It happens is that there's a place in Maharashtra called Hevre Bazaar. See the video. Okay, see the video, Hevre Bazaar. Okay, H-I-W-A-R-E, Bazaar. And this person, Popat Rao, he came here, he said, I want the state government out, I want the central out. We're going to manage it ourselves, we're going to hold accountability. In 10 years, the per capita income went by three times. It's total transformation. Things start to work. When people who are effective get involved, that's one answer to you. Uh, second area is that um, uh, you can take the same thing about leveling the playing field. The entrepreneurial kind of, of India, the acumen is very high, the business acumen. You're going to unleash the power. It's not just big businesses, anybody can. I mean, Google can start here. Can they start in India? One has to ask the question. What does it take? Yeah, a few companies have forces started, but primarily supplying to the Western market. And then they have grown to the Indian market. I think they're up there, but we need to level the playing field. And that's some of the agendas they have. And now, 
they have gotten a lot of very, very intelligent people who really want this change in here, working with them, for them to develop the positions. Right now, their focus is local. So the agenda is coming. Some of them is being published. Some of them is being talked about. The party is very young. And we just started. They've got a lot of things to do. OK, so that is the delivery on promises. The second thing that you asked about is the inducement, the, like the competition, as you call it, the opponents have a lot of money power, a lot of political power. They are in power in MCD. So to be sure, they're inducing. You will see all these kind of stories that they've given this month. Our Army Party starts with no money. Okay, They're going to the money to the common people. So for the funds, I think it's small donations by masses around the world, including Indian citizens in the US are donating. They've donated about, I think, 1.5 crore rupees or something of that order that I read last. Um, and you look at the thing, they're using internet. Internet is free. Internet changes everything. So what happens is that people are getting information. You don't need these huge billboards, uh, which cost lakhs and lakhs and lakhs of dollars. They're having people put posters on their auto rickshaws. You said about the auto rickshaw, they would want to do it. And police started ripping the auto rickshaw. They went to the high court, and they got an order that police cannot rip it apart. Then police took a obscure law, I mean, it's not an obscure law, 2007 which is called defacement of private property is against the law. Okay, <coughs> so they use the law to take out posters from people's own houses who had put themselves off supporters. And just today or yesterday, the High Court again ruled that this is not correct. Election commissioner said, I don't make the laws. I just, they're doing it fine. They're ripping it in people's houses. This defacement of private property. See, that's house is your private property. If somebody is defacing it, you're defacing it. Somebody else is defacing it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, so the question is, the roadblocks will certainly be put. You look at the uh, other thing like no power base, like uh, BJP has MCD power base, Congress has Delhi state power base. They're delaying the permits. So if Ahmadi Park wants to hold a public meeting, they say you've got to get five permissions. And there was a little video, somebody did a, yeah. like a sting, sting operation, operation, I saw yeah. on the internet. Yeah. And they said, okay, um, I, I, there, all my permits are here. He said, no, no, we can't approve it. He said, give it in writing that you can't approve. No, no, I can't give it, but you're not getting the permit. Yeah. So they're putting that you can't hold public meetings. Okay, they clamp down on it. It's backfiring. Because people are realizing what the game is. Uh, then, you know, the, they're detaining the volunteer, if you were an arm cap and you go there, four or five of you, the police will detain you in Delhi because you are having an illegal assembly, political assembly without permission. <laughs> okay? If you're distributing caps, okay, you're bribing the people and inducing them to vote for you. I mean, just, this is, you know, because it's anything more than three rupees. Now, what is three rupees? Maybe it, this law, something was put in 1947, when 3 rupees were really something. <laughs> okay? And people earn 10 rupees a month. Okay? They're saying 3 rupees is a bribe. Okay? So the power, they will fight back. Okay? But you can use these tactics like I talked about David Gula. Against the thing. People are not getting say, hey, you know, this, I want to change the system. This is really not fair. It's not right. So you appeal to the fairness. And control of media houses, I think you mentioned that. So the question is, you create events that media cannot ignore. You get people uh, there. And the, the peop good people in media So who are coming forward. So I really believe that you talk about the addition. What's happening? I don't know if any of you follow. Yogen Yadav, he has been the, one of the most respected pollsters and political scientists uh, in India. He did a convey for 35,000 sample. Yeah. Okay. By an independent Cisco Associates, which is hired to do it. And everything is public. Again, transparency. It's all on the website, how the poll was conducted, the names of the people. Some of the things have been redacted because uh, some names and other things because of uh, privacy issues. But the people, where they're from, and the whole list. And it is showing that our army party is going to get 35 uh, seats, or so 32, 33 seats. And they're on the upswing. The momentum is on their side. Those of you who follow this, momentum is there. So I really think that the inducements can also backfire. If the wave of change is coming. And I really believe there's some wave of change is coming. And uh, later on, we can answer the question 
that the gentleman phrasing the question and answer. So I, I would really like to discuss. Sorry, no, I'll, I'll, after afterwards. Sorry, okay. I'll first, yeah, that's I fine. I, I do realize. I, I do realize. But later on, we will answer that question. I don't want to go into it now. And I think that answers your question, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the part where we give the power to the people <laughs> again. Uh, so we're, you're welcome to ask your questions. Please ensure that you're respectful when you ask, ask your questions. Keep it short because we want the panelists to speak more than our audiences because they are the sort of intellectual elite on this panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I saw one uh, interview with the uh, interview of uh, Arvind Kejriwalji with uh, Anna Goswami uh, on the, I think, frankly speaking. So, uh, what really struck me was uh, uh, how he uh, kind of evaded the question of what if, unfortunately, uh, in this election they don't get elected or they, they, they don't get a majority. So, uh, the question was brought for like twice or thrice, and every time Kejriwalji said, if we lose, this is not our uh, this is not our loss, but this is the loss of the people. This is the loss of the people, and like he said it with such a conviction, but that kind of came across as a bit uh, immature and unpractical. I think, for example, we have we have been um, seeing how it's happening with Lok Sattha Party, and uh, so um, at least like last time I heard, it was only JP who got elected or something like that. So, um, but I really like their optimism. Uh, and I, I just wondering about the uh, the outlook of the outlook of KJV. You, you can take that one. What if they don't win the majority? What are they doing? Okay, I'll answer that to you first. You take it. See, as far as uh, a situation like this, what are you going to do if you lose, right? At the end of the day, it's a hypothetical question. So the media is essentially looking for these kind of questions so they can get a sound bite and say, Arun Kejriwal says, I'm going to. You know, go to the Himalayas because I'd be lost or something. <laughs> so he's not going to give you that sound. Bite. I mean, it's a smart thing to do to say, you know, I don't know. I'm very optimistic. I feel like we're going to win. The pulse is in the, by going out in the street, I'm spending 16 hours in the street. I feel we're going to win. I think that's a perfectly, I mean, there is optimism in it, obviously. There's more than a tinge of optimism probably in it. But at the end of the day, I think it's the right thing to say because who knows what the future has in, has in hold. Well, I'll just say. What he says is what he really is convinced that it is not my loss, it's the people's loss. Okay, that is the message that is being communicated. Now, having said that, I want to talk two things. What are the things that from a long time they have been doing? Like, uh, Sheila Dixit has this automatic phone calls coming to the people yeah. and saying, hey, Aam Aadmi Party is a BJP agent. Okay, they're taking votes away from what you need. Okay, you need the Congress, they're taking vote away from you, so they're a BJP agent. The BJP, they say, hey, you're, they're a Congress agent. Congress has put them in, planted them, <laughs> take votes away from the BJP. The vote Katwa party, okay? Now they're no longer saying that, okay? So question that is there is, the two dominant parties, it's in their interest to say that it is us or Congress, or it's BJP or us, okay? There's no alternative. People of India never had, an, of Delhi never had an alternative before. Now they have a credible alternative. They have to see whether they want clean politics, a new kind of politics, a change, a progressive thing they provide, or do they want the same thing that has been going on for the last 30 years. The players change, but the things are still the same. And that's the kind of question that they have I just wanted to add one more thing to see if I think these are some of the challenges that new parties face. Now, if you think about the same question from another perspective, are they going to ask Sheila Dixit the same question? That if you lose, what are you going to do? Are they going to ask the BJP the same question? What are you going to do? BJP has been losing for the last 12 years, right? Do they go and ask them the same question? So it boils down to the same thing, right? So I think he's doing a very right thing by speaking his heart and saying, I think we're going to win. Let's deal with it when we get there. I wanted to add to that. So uh, this is an interesting question JP always gets is why did he join politics? You know, he was a non-profit organization for a long time, and you should have been there. Why should he? Why did he join <coughs> politics? And he, so he used to counter saying, you know, what people like me are again and other people have two hundred. Now he's asking, you never asked Rahul Gandhi that question. So you never, <laughs> you never asked Jagan that question. You never asked anybody else that question. How? So that guy has a God-given right to enter politics, but I don't. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you for taking my question. Actually, it's a two-part question. One is for the new parties that are coming up. How will they avoid the age-old saying uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts? Absolutely. Uh, if you look at the history, Congress began as an idealistic moment. So did uh, BJP, which was Jansang before it. Again, uh, very idealistic. So whatever I see, good charter here, how do you make sure it remains good after you come to power? Second part of that question, why do we already, even before you have success, why do we see this splintering of, you know, at least two parties, I'm sure there are more parties of this kind. Why not join forces? Why are you two separate parties? If you can address that, that'll be great. And also, they should speak the name too. Okay, I'm Rajiv Purani. Thank you. Rajiv, uh, this is a very, very good question. That, you know, and this is the thing, it, hey, if you're enough in power, you'll be more corrupt, because that's the way. Now, the, how you counteract it? By putting in the DNA of the party, the DNA of the people, by choosing the correct people who have the right thing, and it's true. They can still be corrupted. For example, they've chosen the candidates who they believe and the people around believe that they're completely clean and they have the right mindset. So you start with the right DNA of the people and you put the right DNA in the party, which means they've said that if anything comes to one person, we'll expel them immediately, okay? Forget about criminal. If you see the person is deviating from the honest, truthful, right path, we will get rid of the person. We'll have another election. And that's the way I believe this will happen. The second thing was splintering and different thing. Different parties are starting. They will start to join together. Like BJP, I don't know if you know the uh, history of BJP. BJP started with the Janta Party movement that happened in 1977. My uncle was law minister in the BJP government. And after that, they split. They splintered, and the certain section, the Swatanta Party in that section, formed the Bharti Janta Party. And there was Janta Dal and the person, um, VP Singh, forgot another party. So this kind of, you know, started to kind of splinter. This has not started as a conglomeration of parties that have joined together. It, some parties may join in the thing, or they may just do a thing, clean parties, and only time will tell how this happened. It started as a clean kind of movement or continuum. Uh, can I just add to that one question? Okay. Just just wanted to, uh, I, I just wanted to add to that answer that I believe, so as an economist and as a strategy consultant, I just believe more parties, perfect competition. So I think we, sh we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to Abhay's point. I think corruption happens because there aren't systems in place. I mean, you can, when people realize that there's no deterrent to corruption, then they indulge in corruption. If you know you're going to get caught and get into trouble, then you think twice before corruption. Today, it's possible to get away with corruption. I mean, take the case even of somebody like Lalu Yadav. He's, he's in jail, but the amount of money he's made, he gets to keep it. I mean, it's like there's no system in place to recover the lost cause, right? The lost amounts. Now, so things like Lokpal and having, you know, is essentially a way of having deterrence so that people know that they're being watched. They can't get away with, you know, indulging in corruption. So I think that makes a huge difference to improving the system. So if you have a better system in place, then corruption will be curtailed. Okay. So it's a very good question. I agree with you. It's, it's a ability to give choice and have more choice. More choice is good in a democracy and especially if it's a choice of ideas to pick from. Uh, but we are clear, I mean, uh, you know, it should be obvious with us sitting on the same stage and mutual respect we have, um, that um, Mahatma Gandhi used to say, when the house is on fire, it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor or an engineer, you're all firemen at that time. And uh, that's, the, that's the reason why, irrespective of some policy differences or uh, left-leaning, right-leaning perspective, we're all on the same stage. The also, a historical edition, the court is by Lord Ackham, he says power tends to corrupt. So, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So maybe there's a chance there. <laughs> uh, namaste, my name is Deepti Devakar. I'm the proud granddaughter of Ranganath Ramachandra Devakar, who worked with Mahatma Gandhi as a freedom fighter and spent 11 years in jail as a political prisoner and founder of the Gandhi Peace Foundation and very close friend of JP. In my younger years, 
uh, Gandhi Peace Foundation got into trouble because they were against the emergency and loss of freedom of the press. All the people in the Peace Foundation were arrested illegally, except my grandfather who was very old then. So anyway, I have a very unique responsibility as an Indian American, as a world citizen, as a, having my roots in India, that I'm shocked. I spent eight years in India after living here for many years. The corruption, the way they're canvassing the elections, the lack of literacy, the way education itself has become such a gay, money-making game. But how much a new party can do, because it's so deep, to get a DMV license, to get a car thing, everywhere they ask me for bribes. So um, if it is a new party, we need to educate the public. It will take a long time. Perhaps we can make a start now. Because the old post-colonial bureaucracy is so deep, full of corruption at every rate. Every state. And I completely believe that Loka Sattva and Aam uh, Aadmi Party is clean. I so completely support Anna Hazare. And I want to lend my support to Arvind Kejriwal. Thank you. Great. I'll take another question at the same time. The gentleman next to My name is Sagar. Uh, question is uh, How do you develop uh, the maturity of thought that, uh, as a panel you have, given 50% of the nation is, uh, doesn't have the same access on education? And the second question is uh, around decentralization. So does decentralization mean a single organization uh, breaking out into, into the levels uh, of the society and making a change or uh, it is a combination of uh, multiple uh, organizations like uh, you have here uh, to create an amplifying effect? No. It's not based on, it's more based on area. So like you have a state like Delhi, it will be divided into smaller savas. So each area will have certain, um, what you call flexibility when it comes to funds, functions, and functionaries, essentially. So people who are, so the actual amount of money that's being spent in that particular area will be allocated to that area. And then people in that area will actually meet up and decide on how these expenses are going to be you know, done. So things like basic things like amenities, like lights, roads, things like that would be decided as a group by the people. And then decisions would be taken based on that. So this is primarily with regard to, you know, things that happen in that area, not things like defense or for that matter, anything which is of larger uh, implications. Yeah. Um, so, so the two, two, two parts of the question, one was why decentralization would help and uh, how would you, um, attack such deep-rooted corruption. Um, so the belief that, not the belief, I think the very fundamental uh, core of Lok Sattva is that if you decentralize people, then the people who are responsible for decisions are in front of you. They're a lot more accountable than somebody who's in Delhi. Um, so actually there was a statistic that was run, and uh, JB was talking about one of the districts in Andhra Pradesh, uh, Krishna district, being bigger than New Zealand as a country. It's in fact bigger than 98 other countries on the globe. But the people from that district, you get a transfer for the headmaster has to go to Hyderabad. Uh, and so on and so forth. And then Delhi, everybody has to go to and there's a big lines of VIPs standing for uh, you know their things. And so the, the concept of Gandhiji also was that each village is self-sufficient. The reason is because the headman's right in front of you. And if you know what the headman's supposed to do, you can actually ask him. He's supposed to face you every day which is somebody who's very far off. So the, that's the idea of why decentralization at its root will cut a lot of this uh, corruption. Then there was a question of, so if we do that, is the voter educated enough? And you know, this panel seems, uh, or, or even this audience here seems very, um, very elite. And how do we educate the people on the ground level? And JP, uh, especially, and I know Arvind is that way also, is vociferously against that idea that you have to have a PhD degree to understand this. Whether your kid needs a school, that has a teacher that goes to the school, that parent who, who is a farmer in the village knows. Either the, the farmer in the village knows if the teacher is not showing up, or if the well is not being dug, or if the fist, uh, sanitation is not being done. Um, in fact, there's a case I was talking to, I think, here with Ravi here. Um, JP was asking Rajiv Gandhi right after, Rajiv Gandhi kind of had this concept of, you know, the, but the people are not wise enough at this point. And he asked the Panchayat Raj Minister and the Prime Minister, well, when they voted 500 seats for you, were the wise? Or are you saying that they are unwise because they voted for you? you know? 
So, <laughs> how can they be wise when they voted for you, but not wise to uh, figure out whether their child should go to school or not? Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. 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 I want to answer the question about uh, corruption and what they're going to do to remove it. One is, as Pran mentioned, is a very strong Lokpal bill, which means the things are, if there's a corruption and there's a thing that's investigated, right now Prashant Bhushan, as Kalyan mentioned, has been fighting it himself. He does it without cost. He just kind of puts his time and energy to identify it. RTI has helped him to get the information a little bit. But imagine if there was some power to investigate, some resources to investigate anything, and then, of course, the judiciary decides. But at least you have something to investigate. How many cases can one person investigate? Scams or other things, big scams, small scams. And the second thing is, which is, um, you do by leadership. The re one of the reasons why the thing is, is corrupt from top down. In fact, it becomes a systematic thing. Those of you who saw Satya Brahm movie, the question I asked, you saw how that kind of happened. But there are honest people. In fact, majority of the Indian people are honest. And once, but they need leadership. They're kind of stifling, being stifled in the system. They don't want to be part of the system. So that's, you got to go into their basic nature. I mean, the people who are religious, they follow their religion, and the religion teaches us to be honest and truthful. And that's very good. The third thing is systems. You put the systems that are there that do not encourage corruption. Openness and transparency. So if everything is there out in the open, there's less chance of any corruption. Like, for example, railway reservation system. Those of you who were there before, the computerized railway reservations. You remember how difficult it was to get a ticket to a reservation. You had to go out there and put some money under the table if you want to travel that day. Now, you go on the internet, you get it. Okay, there is priority thing, you pay a little more, but it is yeah, all the open. Is pretty bad hmm? The website yeah. is pretty bad still. The website may be bad, but the question is, but the important thing is that you can get priority and the money does not go in corruption. You, know, you can get priority seating by paying more. You know, that car. Okay, I will travel by Tatka yeah. in India. So you know this thing. So systems and improves. This is just one example. When you, we start to put, uh, put our mind, uh, the Indian mind is very intelligent. People in India are very intelligent. You set their mind in the right direction, they will put those systems. It won't happen overnight. But once the direction is there, it will happen. And the second question that was asked about decentralization, I think you asked that question. And the decentralization is important because we need another level. Right now, there is a central level, there's a state level. The third level is non-existence or weak. For example, the police force is controlled by the state. They should be, like over here, you stay in the towns and things, Stanford. Stanford has its own police. It's not some police from the center or some police from the state coming in, state of California, trooper coming in and arresting the students. So the more you give, some of them, Hibri Bazaar did that. They said, yeah. we want this Maharashtra police out of our village. We will do our own thing. If there's interest of something outside the village, then you can come in. I think this kind of more local control, judicial police, and that's been talked about Arvind and the Ahmadi party. These changes will make it happen. Thank you. Uh, the second row, and get all three visas. So I want to just take off from what you meant. Uh, I'm Seshadri. I'm a student over here uh, doing, studying chemical engineering. Uh, I want to take off from what you talked about, the middle class. And I kind of want to, my, my question is that uh, right now people are voting. Uh, and uh, like, like, for example, when, when a political party goes to campaign, they don't come to my house in India. They would campaign with. Uh, for example, the, in the slum localities nearby, etc. And the logic is probably because less or middle class turn out for voting and more of the poor turn out for voting, etc. But the point is that what are the poor really voting on right now in India? I mean, I, I'm sure that all of you have been in the field. And my question is how, and I, my, my intuition suggests that the poor aren't voting on the basis of corruption because it really doesn't affect them to a large degree. And it affects us because after you reach a certain standard of living, you start worrying about what is right and what is wrong. So what are these core issues which the poor really choose to vote on? And how, how are these new parties going to tackle that uh, those core issues? And, and the second question is, 
also relating to what happens in America, for example. Like, for example, you have these Tea Party Republicans who have their own ideology. But the whole idea of changing the Republican Party from within is a big concept in, in the US. And, I, and my question is why you don't see this happening in India? Uh, yeah, essentially. Hi, my name is Prabhat Dalmia. I have a simple question on the poll reforms. So recently the Supreme Court passed none of the above option. I don't know what happens if none of the above option wins, has the highest. <coughs> so is that, is that a gray area or is there a uh, definite ruling on what will happen? My name is Sri Ayer. I've been a Silicon Valley resident for many years. I have a quick question. For the Delhi polls, is the Election Commission planning to use the new VVPAT EVMs, the new electronic voting machine? Do you know? Because that could have a very big impact on the outcome. I'll take one more question. Yeah, take one more, because some of them are really easy. Just one last question here. Hi, I'm Sandeep. Uh, I also work with the uh, Lok Sattah Party and uh, I have a few comments uh, based on uh, what the three of uh, you have been talking about. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I, I think uh, all of us should kind of, you know, uh, think about the idea of the nation. Uh, and none of us here, not to like target the AAP, but none of us here are Ahmadis. You know, we are. We are the elite of the Indian society, and really, like corruption and whatever, we have found a way of like getting around it. It really doesn't like make a big difference in our uh, lives. And in terms of like you know what new polit new parties can do, it, it like you know they should they should have a radical agenda, a radical social agenda. And these days, like to talk about like if you talk about resource distribution, you are. Uh, you are a communist. If you talk about like caste-based problems, you are a casteist. That's how the Indian middle class belief system works now. And it's also a casteist belief system, right? So like, you know, we, we should talk about this. I'm hoping that the Ahmadmi party and Lok Sattva party like talk a lot more about this. Because if you look at other countries uh, that have gotten out of like being poor, uh, if you compare like human development index, India, not just like with the rich countries, like South Asian countries, we rank like either fourth or fifth out of six. Only Pakistan, for various reasons, is below us. If you compare us to the large countries in the world, like China, Russia, or... Uh, I think we want to hear more. Them. If you have a question, you should finish with a question. Right. Like if you can comment on this, uh, uh, like, you know, other large countries who have got out of poverty have done this. Like they had a radical social agenda, which the political uh, establishment also kind of bought into and made it happen. And the other thing is like, we are that's, talking that's about okay. ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> okay, your EVM question, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think electric computers are no, because they didn't have enough machines yet, because they're not going to get new machines. They're not going to now the new ones. ones. So, not for, for, the, not for even the 2014, they're not doing it. They're going with only a few points. <laughs> now, with regard to your question about you know poor people and what you know what encourages them to to vote, I mean I think from a new party standpoint, they have to you know people give money and liquor on the last day of elections and things like that and make them vote in their favor. But if, assuming for a moment that that was not an issue. I still think that although we think that corruption does not affect them, it does deeply affect them. For example, the electricity cost, for example, recently, um, when Arvind went on fast uh, several months ago, he did it in an actual slum area of Delhi. And there, people were the ones who were actually suffering from high um, electricity costs. So they could actually feel the pinch of corruption themselves. So it's not like corruption does not affect the common man. Simple things like, you know, getting a ration card, for instance, right? There is corruption involved. So at every level, it affects people, and poor people are also affected by that. So if the message gets out to them that, you know, if you don't vote for the same old parties over and over again, and we stand for, you know, something new, which is different, and you're guaranteed of, you know, a better life, less corruption, then people are going to come around. And it's all boils down to being able to have a sustained campaign to educate people on it. 
I'll just uh, add to uh, that particular thing. What are the poor voting on? They, they may not directly vote on anti-corruption as such, but it's indirectly, like education of the children. It is what are we house housing? What is happening? It is about uh, uh, utility bill, as you mentioned, jobs, opportunities. All these are related to corruption. And Aam Aadmi Party is not about just corruption. It's about giving power back to the people. And the poor have been disenfranchised for a long time. They need to do an, I will also handle it because radical social agenda relates to the question that Sandeep raised, uh, which is, that's a radical social agenda to give people the power over their resources. To me, that's the most radical social agenda. Because how am I to decide what's right for them? I mean, is it, they have to tell what the needs are. I want my kid educated because today, yes, we are middle class. Most of us went to, how many of you went to government schools? Okay, central government school? Yeah, but that's a special elite of the central <laughs> government employees. I mean municipal schools. Sorry, I should not have a government. Municipal schools. You went to municipal school. Okay. <clears throat> the, the generally, municipal schools often don't exist. When I was in the villages working, there was a municipal a village school over there. Okay. The video, the, the teacher was paid, I never could find him. There are no students. He's away, no building under the tree. So finally, I tracked the teacher. He said, Baba, I'm Karib Admi. I'm a poor man. Please do not report me to anybody because they no, hardly pay me any salary. I have to tend my farm. I have to do that. Nobody comes. There is no building. There is nothing. That was the state of the, what is called, schools. Some schools function. It's not that everything is like that. It's not all by the same breath. But the question is, poor care about the education of their children. Even the poorest wants to have the opportunity that his child will do well. His child might go to an IIT. His child might become something better than where they are. That opportunity must be available. And that's the radical social agenda in India. So I, I can just Say add about the not, uh, none of the above option. So in Delhi assembly elections, they are going to be used. But uh, again, that's just a more, it's a statement by the voter that he rejects everyone, but the winner will be decided by the rest of the vote. See, you know, if 90% of Delhi says no to a certain candidate, like the rest of the 10% of the votes decide who it is. And with the, the paper audit trail that they're, they're doing it in like a few constituencies, to just, it's a pilot project, so they just got approved in September that there'll be a printer with every electronic voting machine. They'll be able to tell you who you voted for so that no one can do uh, some mischief with that. But that's only, again, a few constituencies will test that out. So at a broader scheme of things, they're not going to test. Uh, like a, it's not as a, the entire assembly elections won't be run with the paper audit trail. Uh, right, right in the back, so the two gentlemen. Right. I think, yeah, get it, yeah, get it. He's been awesome. Okay, uh, my name is Rohit Kumar. I just have a quick question. Do you know who's, I mean, there has been a lot of debate about the Lokpa and how it's going to solve 60%, 70% problem of corruption. Do you know who's the Lokpa in the US or in Germany or France or, or any other country where it has been successful? And then I compare, well, the second question is, I compare the the, the government similar to the management team in a corporate world. There is no role for such kind of a thing in a corporate world. If anybody knows that, can you please tell me? I understand CEO, CFO, CTO, CIO, but where is that low part kind of a role in a corporate world? And why we are so much thinking that that alone is going to solve 60, 70 percent current. We'll, we'll take yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Srinivas. Uh, it's good to see both parties, which are like you know known to be good parties right now in India, on the same stage. And uh, I have a question for both parties actually. Both parties are asking about like you know educated people to get into the politics, youth to get into the politics. Don't we have educated people in the politics already? Our PM, our, uh, uh, yeah. they are there, right? <laughs> so what are we trying to make some difference? Uh, bringing the new educated people, right? 
And the second thing is uh, JPA opposes from uh, you know freebies in Andhra Pradesh, and he ridicules other parties who give away freebies in the south, right? But here Arvind is proposing freebies. He is you know that's the agenda. How are these two gonna you know go on the same path? Hi, uh, my name is Pranav. Uh, so, several parties are going around speaking to the auto unions, uh, speaking to people who live in slums, and I, I understand those are important people to speak to to understand their problems. But when these parties go to universities, it somehow doesn't become about the problems the students themselves face, it's about the problems that everyone else is facing and why the students should be worried about how those problems are going to be solved. What about employment? What about jobs? We have the biggest demographic under 30 in the country right now. And there's a massive shortfall of jobs coming in the next five years. Uh, how do parties plan to incentivize companies to feel that India is a, a safe and viable investment destination? So, what are you doing about jobs? One more. <coughs> My name is Kavi, and uh, to continue on his uh, comment of freebies, I believe the moderator let Abhiji <coughs> off the hook for the question uh, related to uh, the details about two promises that he asked uh, uh, how those promises of free water and uh, <coughs> and uh, reduce the, rates for electricity sorry reduce rates for electricity no it was uh, the uh, the women's security force mm. uh, what are the details of that and how those promises will be implemented okay. that's why we have the audience <laughs> <laughs> so when you bring responses to that let me take this <laughs> So, Rohit, first one, oh, Lokpal. Um, so, uh, Hong Kong um, is the biggest example for this. Actually, um, Abhay's uncle placed Lokpal in the parliament first, right? So, he, he was the minister, and he was the law minister, and he placed the thing in the government first because there was uh, there's no single investigative authority inside the country. Uh, the reason that was required was because of the rampant corruption. So, if there is if individual organizations have expectation of service levels, even at the DMV, which usually is, is blamed, right? You go in, there's an expected service level for everything. And such service level expectations are not around in India. And therefore, then it becomes basically arbitrary in terms of who, who does this. The biggest example of this was Hong Kong. Hong Kong in the 70s was one of the large, world's worst corrupt environment. Um, the ambulance won't pick up a corpse until you got paid. Uh, after the bill was introduced in six years, they are one of the cleanest. And still, actually, are still one of the most clean environments in the world. Uh, same people, same individuals, same systems, just transformed within one decade of, of this. I'll just know. add to that. That sure. is for ICAC in Hong Correct. Kong, and that started in 1974. Hong Kong is not a country, so... No, give I, me an example of a country. No, it was an independent uh, administrative region. Okay. Okay. I think it's yeah. an agency. Okay. But, yeah, but, but the idea is that have a single ombudsman. So in a, in a corporate sector, there's ombudsman, whistleblowers, there's laws in house that says in every every cafeteria, every place where public assemble, you can you have a email system where you can write to an ombudsman and it goes that's, into an inquiry that's office. That's the chief ethics officer. No, no, it goes into every every complaint to the ombudsman gets gets uh, reviewed and analyzed. That's why Enron failed and after Enron that's when they, they initiated this saying that uh, you should allow for whistleblowing in a, in, in a, in, with some secrecy <coughs> for people. Um, uh, so the other question was about freebies and why is uh, you know AAP is giving away some things and how how come we are? Uh, I said before there are some policy differences, some perspective. <coughs> we are not uh, completely aligned in everything, and, and again, uh, nothing to say that we won't change over a period of time or they won't change to to, to align better. Um, but uh, again, we don't believe that what they're giving away is a is like a TV or a idli mixer or things like that, right? So they're giving away things which qualify still as fundamental requirements of of uh, of living, uh, as opposed to like a color TV being given away or an idli mixer giving away, um, which but is it is luring up water, right? It is creating a, an environment of uh, yeah of, of that, but as long as there's an economic uh, uh, plan behind it, which says that this won't rob the uh, exchequer based on that, we believe it makes sense. Um, you talk about job creation. Uh, job creation is something that uh, 
Uh, I think the Ahmadi party is, is inviting uh, some stalwarts to start thinking about. Um, Lok Sutta's position is quite clear. Job creation has to happen, decentralized, de urbanization to the extent possible. Um, uh, have English language education in a. If we took Andhra Pradesh, the idea was to create a thousand cities in Andhra Pradesh, not one, not two, but a thousand. And that's because you can create uh, both the, the traditional educational system stuff, which where people learn your engineering and so on, but there's also vocational jobs that you can create by the hundreds. You create schools, colleges, um, health institutions, all kinds of things in, in the top towns. And all those create jobs. Uh, and all those create uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs in the cities where the people have to be close to their farms, where they can farm and still work and close to their family. Because one of the biggest problem with crime also right now is because uh, of the amount of immigration that's happening in these large cities. And it's just nameless, faceless people coming in by the millions in the large cities. They have no system of check. I mean, the biggest check system for crime is your own family. It's being known, it's being seen when somebody, uh, when you're doing something wrong. But if you're a nameless, faceless person in an ocean, then you have basically no restraint. So that has uh, all kinds of uh, connections and uh, Actually, some of this is what Prashant has actually all helped us uh, frame as well. I just wanted to respond to your question about the Lokpa. I think if you look at, um, you know, present day situation where you have corruption issues in India today. Now, when an investigation happens, the CBI investigates, right? So a comparison to a to a corporate sort of setting is not entirely fair. It's not exactly the same thing because, for example, today you have all these scams, right? Who, who is to investigate these scams? The CBI investigates the scam. So the CBI reports into whom? The current government, right? So today, repeatedly, the CBI is being used as a pawn by the ruling party because the CBI is not independent. So you, you have to have an independent investigative agency which can go in and investigate an issue and come up with its own, you know, sort of final decision on what, what has happened without the interference of the ruling party. And that is essentially what Lokpal is. They're talking about taking the CBI and making it independent. That has to be a first step. That absolutely is essential. It's happened and it's been continuing to be used by those in power for like for the last several decades. So that's something that needs to definitely happen. So that is essentially what the Lokpal really is. And uh, with regard to the uh, freebie question, at least let me address the electricity issue. I think the Aam Party's stance on reducing electricity rates is based on the assumption or the belief that the rates are currently inflated. Right. And the rates are currently inflated because the industry and the government are in cohorts and the politicians on both sides of the aisle are in cohorts. So the view of the Aam Aadmi Party, from my understanding, is that electricity rates can be brought down provided there's transparency about how the prices are arrived at and what the right price is, as opposed to people behind the scenes deciding you know, what the price should be and then getting people to pay for it. What about the water? The water part, I'm not entirely sure. Is it because, is it to do with... Actually, I have a point to Arvind's uh, speech at Stefan's college. It has all the quantitative details how the water will be distributed. That's correct. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, basically, and all the quantitative details, the blueprint, and why, basically, and what is the plan for that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely correct because where the water is going, how it is being stopped, and the private trucks go to give water to sell water and there has been some illusion that it is for that reason the people are not getting water. But the question of water is a basic right. We're not talking about thousands of gallons of water. We're talking about drinking water and a small amount of supply per person. And this is about jokies and jokeries. Right. How are you going to charge them? The water does not come there. I mean, when you go to retail, you send a person coming in to your house and saying, Saab, ek, ek can I take a bucket of water? And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. The availability and thing, the system just needs to be perfect. Yeah. I think I think the I shouldn't be answering with my own question. <laughs> I look sort of facetious, but I think the broad level argument that so it, there was there's a difference that I was trying to point out in the in the in the policy making as well as how you try to win an election. So Wiley makes the argument that 
since over a period of time, probably Delhi citizens have paid a lot more, about almost two and a half times that they should have for drinking water. And if, if you're from Delhi, you know the amount of corruption that happened in the Sonia Vihar water treatment plant, as well as in electricity. He, he proposes to take that burden off the Delhi citizen by making it free for a certain amount of time. But the way he frames it in any advertisement or, uh, or the way he uh, proposes it to people is free water or free electricity. And maybe that's a reality that of election campaigning anywhere is that you try to win over someone by giving free things. But I guess that's the more broader quantitative argument. Well, and and uh, regarding to the Lokpal, I think uh, the, so there are offices, um, uh, if you look at the top 10 HDI countries in the world, Human Development Index, Finland, Dem Denmark, you look at the UK from where we imbibed our constitutional system, everyone has an office of government arm as in most of the British colonies or people who took their origin from the British Raj, happened that government became too big. Uh, they were able to implement an ombudsman system who was able to monitor these arms of government. But I think the broader, I think for the more problematic thing with India is that we're such a big country that even having someone to monitor these arms of government is like creating another arm of government. So to monitor 10,000 people, you need 1,000 people, which is again adding another layer of, so to speak, government, which is why it doesn't, it seems like you're adding more bureaucracy, more uh, legislative inefficiency in that system. Yeah, I think just on the first question about uh, Lokpal, I think you mentioned CBI which is not independent. There's another thing called Vigilance Commission and Vigilanting in every department. Uh, they don't have any power. All they can do is recommend to the minister that I found some corruption in your, if you have a vigilance officer. All they can do is recommend to the manager that I found some vigilance. They have no teeth. That means they cannot file any case. They, all they do is recommend to the manager. So those are the two issues in the current system. Lokpal tends to fix those issues. But things have to be improved. I mean, like how that will happen will happen. Change will happen, but slowly. The second question that was there about, uh, that was raised about university students and problems and having jobs. That is a very important. Entrepreneurship and new businesses are key to creating jobs in today's world. And so many of my friends who have been successful over here, they've tried to run a business in India. They found that they have to be corrupt, they have to bribe this person for everything, you know like safety inspection, this inspection. They wanted to start an industry. It was awful. They left and they came over here. They immigrated to the United States and they were doing very well. So we want to create an environment in Delhi for the students where people can get together and say, I want to start. Yes, go ahead. So uh, just to address that point, uh, 